Welcome to the Dingir Zone. Hi, I'm Victor. And today I finally want to talk about Noah's Flood, the Deluge. And um, I want to compare that to the Gilgamesh epic. Um, you probably have already heard about the Gilgamesh epic. It's relatively well known today that um, yeah, there's this older um, text from Babylon called the Gilgamesh epic where uh, there's also a story of a great flood, right? And um, yeah, but when you talk about this with uh, theists, they're gonna say something like, well, floods exist in real life. So somebody would write about them, why not? So, and if you have multiple stories about floods, yeah, there's gonna be some overlap, of course. But uh, yeah, I'm not talking about some overlap. This isn't some similarities. Uh, I will really compare this. And yeah, at the end of this, I hope that you will uh, agree with me that, uh, yeah, this isn't just some similarities. Uh, this is really the same story, okay? But before I start, I want to go through a few other um, flood stories. And um, yeah, then I will really compare uh, the Noah flood with the Gilgamesh epic point for point and um, and yeah these stories are so similar it I'm afraid it might get a bit boring uh, hearing the same story just twice so um, but don't uh, close the tab don't leave uh, in the end I want to talk about something that's a real bombshell and that's really gonna blow your mind so um, yeah uh, if you get bored some, uh, somewhere through, just jump to this uh, time code and uh, then you can uh, continue with that. I promise it's worth your time. Okay, so I first want to talk about the epic of Atrahasis. Um, that's an even older story. Um, the uh, oldest copy of that was found in a city called Shurupak. Uh, keep that name in mind, that's a really important name later. Um, like the Bible, it also uh, starts with a creation account. Here it says, when the gods were man. Interesting start. Kind of reminds me of uh, God created man in his image. Um, they did forced labor. Okay. Um, the great Anuna gods were burdening the Igigi gods. Okay, so we have two kinds of gods, and the uh, the one kind forces the other kind to uh, to work. They dig the water courses, and um, um, yeah, they create the springs from the depth. Um, the depth, by the way, uh, you might want to remember that. Uh, the, the depth uh, or the deep as you find it in the Bible. Um, that's actually talking about the Sumerian worldview. Um, they believed that underneath the earth there was another ocean. Okay, so the, the whole earth was just swimming on this ocean and that's where um, where earthquakes came from. Like uh, this was just like a boat that is rocked, right? And um, uh, and that's, that's also where groundwater comes from. You know, when you dig uh, deep enough into the ground, you get to water. And that's uh, what they thought, that there was an ocean underneath the earth. And they also believed that the firmament was uh, a dome and um, there was an ocean above that dome also. Okay, so when it rained, uh, the water came through little holes in that dome. Okay, that's, uh, that's how they explained rain. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, that's what this depth is talking about. And uh, yeah, let's uh, compare that to uh, Noah di directly. Here it's uh, in uh, Genesis 7:11. All the fountains of the great deep broken up and all the windows of heaven were opened. Yeah, this is exactly what I was talking about. Um, these fountains of the great deep this is what they were building here, right? The, uh, the springs from the depth. Um, 
so this is uh, really the water coming from underneath the earth coming up here in Noah's flood and yeah the windows of heaven right the, uh, there's an ocean above heaven and uh, when you open the windows then you get flooded right here um, they also created the mountains okay these igigi gods and uh, they did that for 40 years that's an interesting number don't you think because how often do you find the number 40 in the bible right uh, just think of uh, of moses you know he was 40 years old when he uh, fled to midian he lived there for 40 years then he uh, he guided the hebrews out of egypt and uh, lived for another 40 years uh, you know um, living in the desert and then uh, at 120 years old he died right and uh, yeah 40 is really an important number in the bible you find that everywhere in the bible um, okay so these igigi gods are complaining kind of reminds me of the exodus but okay um, uh, they complain that the foreman must take off the heavy duty uh, also like exodus and also like uh, the enuma elish um, okay so they demand uh, to have less work um, uh, in exodus and in the enuma elish um, the guys who have all this work also demand to have less work but in both these stories uh, the pharaoh or tiamat uh, react by giving them even more work right and yeah unfortunately we don't know if that happens here too because there are some lines missing um, but yeah if they actually had given them less work then the next thing wouldn't have happened they call for battle okay so i think we can conclude that at least they didn't reduce the work okay um, the gods heard his words they set fire to their tools um, they put fire to their spaces and flame uh, to their work baskets off they went one and all to the gate of the warrior and Leel's abode so they go to the main god um, who is in charge of everything um, okay so they surround his house um, but it's night and Enlil is sleeping. That's kind of funny, right? Thinking of gods as sleeping. Uh, yeah, but yeah, that's what they do in these old stories. They are very human-like because we were created in their image, remember? Um, uh, here it was night. Uh, Ekur was surrounded. Ekur is uh, a temple in Nippur. Uh, which was just uh, the temple of Enlil um, and Ekur means uh, house of the mountain A is house and Kur is mountain so this is a house of the mountain and the Ekur temple was actually on a mountain so uh, yeah and um, Enlil was often called the great mountain so um, so I think it makes sense that the great mountain lives in the house of the mountain, right? Okay, so Enlil is sleeping. He doesn't realize what's going on. Now here's some lines missing again, unfortunately. Not really clear what's going on here. Um, apparently the great gods sent a messenger, uh, Nushku, uh, took his weapons and went uh, in the assembly of all the gods he knelt stood up anu enlil ninurta and enugi have sent me to say uh, who is the instigator of this battle okay so who is responsible for this attack here uh, who declared war um, he transgressed the command of enlil that's of course uh, unacceptable Right, and Leel is the great god. You are not allowed to uh, do anything against his will. Um, but they say every one of us gods has declared war. Our forced labor was heavy, the misery too much. 
And um, yeah, so now there's this problem that uh, there's too much work to do and uh, the gods refuse to do this work anymore. So what they do now is Ea, the god of wisdom, also called Enki in Sumerian, um, he proposes that Belet Ili, which is a, an epithet of Ninchosang, the mountain goddess, um, the Sumerian Gaia, if you will, um, the midwife is present. Let her create then a human, a man. Okay, so the solution to the problem of there being too much work for all the gods is they create humans. <laughs> so that is why we are created in the first place. Our purpose is to work, create food, and then sacrifice part of that food to the gods. Okay, so that they have enough to eat. And that is something that you also see in uh, Genesis 8.20, uh, where Noah built an altar to the Lord and took off every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. So yeah, this is what people do in, uh, in the Bible also. They sacrifice food to God. And, um, and by the way, this is uh, not so well known, but Noah didn't take two of each kind, right? Uh, of the clean beasts, uh, he took seven. Uh, otherwise, yeah, if he sacrifices some of them here, uh, the species would die out, right? If he had only two. And by the way, if we didn't sacrifice enough food to the gods, then the gods might get angry with us and come and eat us. So uh, yeah, that's that. Okay, back to the Atrahasis epic. Um, uh, the task is Enki's, so the god of wisdom has to design humans. He has to decide how to create humans. And um, let him provide me the clay so I can do the making. Enki made ready to speak and uh, said to the great gods, let one god be slaughtered. Okay. Um, first of all, humans are made from clay. That's pretty interesting, don't you think? Because in the Bible they are made from uh, dirt, but uh, yeah, dirt with water is clay. And yeah, Enki is a water god. So if a water god takes dirt, he gets clay or something like that. So uh, yeah, it's, it's basically the same material uh, they use here. Um, Okay, uh, but he does that by slaughtering one god. Okay, that's a pretty interesting thing um, um, here. Uh, they mix the flesh and blood of this one god and uh, mix that with the clay. And uh, the thing is, from the flesh of the god, let a spirit remain. Okay, so the spirit of the god kind of um, remains within the humans. Okay, that's important because down here they, th they slaughtered Awilu, who had the inspiration in their assembly. Now, who is Awilu? From the text, it seems that um, the one who had the inspiration, he may have been the leader of this rebellion. So what this means is they slaughtered a rebellious god and, um, well, a rebellious god would have rebelliousness in his blood. Um, that's a composition fallacy, but uh, that's the way they thought. And uh, yeah, to this day, people, uh, many people believe stuff like that. Um, um, for example, there's more than enough people who claim that uh, morality cannot come from matter, which doesn't know morality itself. Um, yeah, whatever. But uh, yeah, that's the way they thought. Um, a rebellious god would have rebellious blood. And if that is used in our creation, this would make us rebellious too, right? And that's something that you find a lot in the Bible, you know, when it uh, talks about humans being stiff-necked or something. Um, yeah, here we have the explanation why they are stiff-necked, because they have this 
blood of this uh, rebellious god. But uh, okay, back to this god Awilu. Um, who is that? Well, um, we don't know very much about him, but um, a few epithets of him are Ilawela, Geshtu, Geshtue, Weila. Um, apparently, at least according to this uh, Tumblr discussion here, um, the name apparently just means something like uh, man god or god man, um, which may be referring to this part here when the gods were man. And of course, it would make sense in a way that when you create man, you would use the flesh and blood of a god named man god, right? Um, but um, yeah, there's also uh, this Tumblr discussion references an article by Elster uh, in the book Riches Hidden in Secret Places. Uh, so yeah, here they talk about it being a pun. Um, also in this uh, article here. Um, then there's uh, the god Enki in Sumerian royal ideology and mythology by Peter Espak. Um, let's download that PDF. Um, here he also says that uh, another epithet of this god is Wei. So that's interesting because um, in Rick and Morty, uh, there's one uh, passage where Rick says that the god Yahweh is a syncretization of a god Yah with a god Wei, right? And um, I mean, Yah is Eya Enki, I would say. But uh, yeah, this would be this Wei, apparently. Um, I don't see much of a reason why uh, you would syncretize these two gods. You know, they are very different. Um, one of them is super important and the other one isn't. Um, it might make sense when you um, when you want to um, turn monotheist that, uh, well, you still have this god creating humans, then uh, both of these gods need to exist in your, uh, in your combined story, but uh, yeah, I don't think that uh, Rick and Morty is right here. I don't think that uh, uh, Eya and Wei, I don't think that uh, this is the origin of the name Yahweh. But if I'm wrong, and this Awilu actually is uh, the origin of that name Yahweh, then uh, yeah, then this is that God. Okay, whatever. Um, back to the story. So now the humans exist, but um, yeah, then um, they are apparently immortal in the beginning. But uh, yeah, then um, they are fruitful and multiply. And uh, then there are so many humans that uh, their noise disturbs the gods. Okay, Enlil in particular. And um, Enlil then decides to wipe out humanity with a flood. And this might even be the origin of the name Noah. You see, Enlil wants to kill all humans because he wants there to be silence so that he can rest, right? And the word Noah is Hebrew for rest. This might be an ironic twist that somebody added. Enlil kills all humans because he wants to have rest. And the ironic twist then might be that he gets rest in the sense that one man named to rest survives. But Enki is against this plan. He doesn't want humanity to be destroyed. And that really makes a lot more sense than in the Bible, right? Here you have one God who wants to destroy humans and one who wants to save them and then save the one human 
Whereas uh, in the Bible, you have one God who wants to destroy all humans, but then double crosses himself and saves one human. That doesn't really make sense. Okay, here it makes much more sense that uh, these are two different gods, one who destroys mankind and one who saves one human um, by sending him a dream. Well, Enlil forbids him to, uh, to tell uh, anyone about this plan. And well, he's the main god. Enki cannot uh, transgress this. He has to obey this command. But uh, yeah, he's a god of wisdom. He always finds ways around everything. So he doesn't tell a human. He talks to a reed wall. And <laughs> yeah, Atrahasis just happens to be standing by and hearing it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't think that defense would hold up in court, but okay. Uh, and here he tells him, flee the house, build a boat, forsake possessions and save life. Okay, the boat which you build be something, be equal something, roof her over like the depth. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'd say that he describes the dimensions of um, this boat because that's what happens in this uh, place in all the other stories, but uh, here it's broken, so we don't know for sure. Um, he also uses pitch, which uh, the flood heroes do in all these stories. Uh, he told it of the coming of the seven day deluge. Seven days, that's also something you see a lot in these stories. Now, Atrahasis builds this boat but he has help. That's a difference to Noah who builds a boat himself, which is logistically impossible, but uh, Ken Ham <laughs> tried to prove the opposite and failed uh, because when he built his uh, Ark Encounter, then uh, yeah, he used power tools and uh, all sorts of stuff that wouldn't be available at the time. So uh, yeah, he didn't prove anything. Uh, okay. But uh, yeah, Atrahasis has help. And uh, this of course raises the question, what's with these helpers? You know, do they die in the deluge? Yeah, they die. Um, in the case of Noah, some people say, well, God offered people to uh, be saved, but they refused, so it's their own fault. Um, so to, to rationalize why other people didn't come uh, onto the boat. Here you have people who would have known about the boat and uh, why didn't they board the boat here? And um, yeah, here uh, Atrahasis just lies to them. Uh, uh, he tells the elders, um, uh, Enki told him to do this, um, to, uh, to lie to the people that um, his god Enki uh, has some trouble with Enlil and uh, uh, Enki and Enlil are constantly angry with each other. They have expelled me from the land because he's uh, an Enki worshipper and Enlil doesn't allow him on his land anymore. And that's why he builds a boat to leave. Um, yeah, so that's, that's why um, the other people here uh, don't come with him. And uh, yeah, then he, uh, they built the ark he sacrifices animals just like Noah. Noah just does it afterwards. Um, and then he brings uh, on board some animals. I don't think it says how many of them. He invited his people to a feast. So they uh, have you know, a party and then uh, he boards the boat while the others are still uh, drinking and eating. And Atrahasis is really sad about this whole thing. Um, and then the deluge starts. Okay, Adat began to roar in the clouds. That's an interesting difference. You know, uh, this isn't a monotheistic story, and here we just have the storm god doing the uh, flooding. Uh, so, of course, that makes sense. The god they heard his clamor. He brought pitch to seal his door. That's another interesting point. Uh, the door being sealed with pitch, that's again something you see all the time in these stories. 
uh, something they all have in common. And yeah, now we have the Great Flood. Anzu rent the sky with his talents. Um, yeah, the sky opens, all the water comes down from above the sky, right? Um, then it uh, describes the flood in relatively horrific terms. The flood came forth, its power came upon the peoples like a battle. One person did not see another. They could not recognize each other in the catastrophe. The deluge bellowed like a bull. The wind resounded like a screaming eagle. The darkness was dense, the sun was gone. Now, the gods find themselves hungry because there are no farmers left and uh, sacrifices are no longer brought. When they discover that Atrahasis has survived, they make a plan to make sure that the noise will remain within limits. So they don't want another deluge, so they make a plan so that Enlil doesn't do any more flooding, right? So Enki said to Nintu, the birth goddess, um, establish death for all peoples. Okay, this is why we are mortal, because otherwise we would uh, just multiply too much and then uh, we would be too loud and uh, anger in Lille, right? So Enki has decided humans should be mortal. Let there be also among the people the Pasitu, she-demon. Let her snatch the baby from the lap who bore it and establish high priestesses and priestesses. Let them be taboo and so cut down childbirth. Yeah. Uh, infant mortality and uh, celibacy are also there to keep the numbers of humans down. This here sounds like a description of Lilith um, in later stories. Yeah. Okay, so this was a relatively long story. Uh, sorry about that, but I think this is really necessary. Um, just the insight into the culture, what people back then believed and what the other stories uh, grew out of. Um, but um, let's look a bit further back even. The flood story from Suma, that's ETCSL number 174, if you're looking for it. I think it might be an alpha version of the Atrahasis epic or maybe an incomplete copy of it, I don't know. But uh, yeah, let's look into that. So it uh, already starts with uh, approximately 36 lines missing. But uh, someone here says, I will, I don't know, stop the perishing of my mankind. For Nintur, I will stop the annihilation of my creatures. Okay, um, who says this? I would argue it's Enki. Whoever says this says, I will stop the annihilation of my creatures. Okay, so who created this mankind here? Uh, that's here. An, Enlil, Enki, and Nilchosang had fashioned the black headed people, humans, Sumerians. Um, so it can only be one of these four here, I think. Uh, Nintur is Nilchosang. So uh, if the person does it for Nintur, she's out. And An and Enlil agree to uh, destroy mankind, so they are also out, and then that only leaves Enki. So I think it's Enki who says here uh, that he will stop the perishing of his mankind, the annihilation of his creatures. This text is unfortunately relatively broken, but uh, it speaks about some flood also. Okay. Um, it also has a survivor, Tsiu Sutra, the Guduk priest. He is humble, committed, reverent, uh, yeah, a great human being like Noah. You know, Noah is also um, described similarly. And Tsiu uh, Sutra, the king, um, actually is. Uh, in the Sumerian king list, uh, one of the kings of Shurupak. Remember that name, Shurupak? That's where the oldest copy of uh, the Atrahasis epic was found. So here we have another connection to that city, Shurupak. Remember that. 
see a sutra standing at its side, heard side war standing at my left side. Uh, I will speak words to you. Uh, so here again, we have some god talking to, uh, or someone talking to a wall and uh, the flood hero just accidentally hearing it, just like in the Atrahasis epic. Um, a flood will sweep, uh, a decision that the seed of mankind is to be destroyed has been made. The order announced by Anand and Lil cannot be overturned, right? Anand and Lil want the destruction. Now, again, a lot of lines missing. So uh, we actually don't know if uh, Tsiu Sudra built a boat, but um, yeah, down here, more and more animals disembarked onto the earth. Yeah, so there must have been some boat with animals on them. Otherwise, uh, the animals cannot disembark, right? So, uh, yeah. Um, after the flood had swept over the land um, and windstorms had rocked the huge boat for seven days and seven nights, again, seven days, uh, Utu the sun god came out. Tsiu Sutra drills an opening into the boat. Uh, that's a small difference. In most other stories, there's just a window. Okay. Um, but there's still some kind of an opening here. That's again, very common in these stories. And uh, yeah, after this, uh, the king sacrificed oxen and innumerable sheep. Also something that is very common in these stories. We've had that in Noah and Atrahasis also. Um, because Tsiusudra prostrated himself before Anand and Lil, uh, they treated Tsiusudra kindly. Uh, they granted him life like a god. They brought him down. Uh, they brought down to him eternal life, and they settled him in an overseas country in the land Del Moon, the land of the or the, the island of the gods in these old stories. Um, I've talked about that uh, in the. Um, in the video about Adam and Eve, that yeah, the moon is just Bahrain, the an, an island uh, in the Persian Gulf, and uh, yeah, but that was considered the island of the gods, where the sun rises. Okay, so now let's finally compare Noah's Ark to the Gilgamesh epic, Tablet Eleven. Um, yeah, this text here unfortunately doesn't have line numbers, which would make it hard for me to talk about it. Um, so I just put this in a LibreOffice writer document, adding line numbers. And yeah, here is Genesis 6. Okay. Um, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. Who are these sons of God? Um, some people would argue that this is that these are the Nephilim uh, that you find in a few places in the Bible. And um, actually, uh, the Genesis Apocryphon that I want to make a vid another video about, um, uh, yeah, at least sounds like uh, the existence of these Nephilim is actually the reason why God floods uh, the earth in the Noah story. But uh, yeah, just, that's just an aside. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Um, this is in the beginning of the story, but he also limits uh, the lifespan of humans here. Right, uh, pretty interesting connection to these uh, other stories. Um, also, 120 years is the age that uh, uh, Moses reaches. Um, it's also, I think, a guy named Namtsitara in Sumerian mythology uh, talks about humans uh, living for 120 years. Okay. Um, here in line 12, 
the Gilgamesh epic mentions the city Shurupak. Remember, that's the, the story where the oldest copy of the Atrahasis epic was found. That's the city whose king, Siyosudra, is the hero in the Sumerian flood story. And here is it's explicitly mentioned Shurupak, a city that you surely know. Um, yeah, really important city. Remember that. It's, uh, it's going to come back later. Okay. Um, now let's come to some actual comparisons here. There were giants in the earth in those days. Okay, that's a quite peculiar sentence. Uh, that's not an, uh, a sentence that you would find often in, the, in such stories. You know, you would have kings uh, conquering neighboring cities or something. That's something that you would see all the time. Here, I think that's uh, a sentence that's not so uh, common that you should expect it to find it multiple times. That city was very old and there were gods inside it. That's pretty much the same sentence, right? It's here giants are in the earth and here gods are inside the city. I think that's pretty much the same sentence and a peculiar sentence. By the way, uh, if you've seen the, uh, the Russell Crowe movie, Noah, uh, people were furious about these uh, stone giant uh, creatures uh, that are featured there. And they said, how can they make such uh, something so unrealistic? Yeah, I, th I also think that uh, the Bible is unrealistic. So right here we have these giants. This is not something that they just added. This is, this is in the Bible. Maybe you should read the Bible before uh, accusing uh, Russell Crowe of adding nonsense. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Genesis 6 9. Um, Noah walked with God. And in line 7, um, this is um, Gilgamesh talking to Utnapishtim, the survivor, the, the flood survivor. And he asks him, Hey, how, how come you are immortal? I want to be immortal too. And then Utnapishtim tells him the story. And yeah, here. Uh, Gilgamesh asks, how is it that you stand in the assembly of the gods? I think this is also comparable. Um, then here God warns Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Line 20 to 22 over here. Ea, Enki, the clever prince, was under oath with them, he wasn't allowed to talk to a, to a human. He wasn't allowed to tell him about this. So he talks to Reed House, Reed House, Wall, Wall, man of Shurupak, son of Uburatutu. Uburatutu is, I think, the name of the father of Tsiusudra in the Sumerian king list. That's an even better connection. Great. Um, so uh, yeah, here we again have the same uh, motive that Ea uh, is not allowed to talk to him directly, so he talks to a reed wall. God says, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Yeah, here, O man of Shurupak, son of Ubura Tutu, tear down the house and build a boat. And uh, he's supposed to use pitch. Here in Genesis 6.19, of every uh, living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark. So he tells him to bring animals on the board. And over here, what do we have here? Spurn possessions and keep alive living beings. Make all living beings go up into the boat. All living beings. OK, that's a bit more. Uh, the boat which you are to build. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. So Noah obeys. And so does Utnapishtim. My Lord, thus is the command which you have uttered. I will heed and will do it. Um, over here, he again asks uh, what to tell the elders and uh, Ea tells him to lie to them um, that he's not allowed in this land anymore because of uh, the trouble between Enki and Enlil. Okay, in Genesis 6.15, um, we have technical specifications. 
The length of the arc shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. Over here in line 28, the boat which you shall build, its dimensions must measure equal to each other, its length must correspond to, it, to its width. Roof it over like Apsu. Okay. Um, its walls were each 10 times 12 cubits in height. The sides of its top were of equal length, 10 times it cubits each. I don't understand that sentence. Um, whatever. Pitch it within and without with pitch. Okay. Again, he uses pitch. The child carried the pitch. Yeah. Utna Pishtim also uses pitch. A window shalt thou make to the ark. Okay. I opened a vent and fresh air, daylight, fell upon the side of my nose. So Utna Pishtim also has a window. A lower, second and third stories shalt thou make it. So uh, Noah's Ark shall have three levels. Um, this actually reminds me of the uh, Zoroastrian version of the story um, that I will mention later. Uh, there you have this city with uh, three sections. Um, in the Gilgamesh epic, uh, this is actually different. Here in line 60, I provided it with six decks thus dividing it into seven levels. Okay. Um, then in verse 21, And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. So Noah brings food on board. There were three times 3,600 porters of casks who carried vegetable oil apart from the uh, 3,600 units of oil which they consumed and two times 3,600 units of oil which the boatmen stored away. So yeah, that's also um, food for, for uh, the animals and the passengers. Then um, the deluge starts. Genesis 7, 4. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Again, number 40. And uh, here you also have seven days, but I think it means that um, seven days from now I will start. Okay. Um, I think in the other stories you have uh, the um, the raining lasting for seven days. Okay, now over here, um, they actually launch the boat. I think in the Noah story, uh, at least the way we've all heard it, uh, the boat just stands there on the ground and then the water rises up and lifts the boat. But um, yeah, here he's lying to the people. They uh, they wouldn't believe him if the boat wasn't uh, built near some water and uh, without a way to actually launch that boat. And yeah, here they launch it. Yeah, only after that, uh, all the living beings that I uh, had, I loaded on it. I had all my kith and kin go up into the boat, so his family also is saved. All the beasts and animals of the field and the craftsmen I had go up, so he also has some people coming with him. And in the self same day entered Noah and Shem, Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. So Noah also takes some further people, you know, his uh, daughters-in-law. But yeah, what is this? All the living beings that I had. So he doesn't save all animals, only some, only the ones he had. I don't know. Uh, the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Yeah, already talked about that. Um, so the deluge starts. 97. 
I watched the appearance of the weather. The weather was frightful to behold. And they that went in, went in, male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The door is sealed. Okay. Here this also happens. I went into the boat and sealed the entry. Again, the door is sealed, just as in all the other stories. The rain starts. Um, the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. Over here the rain starts. There arose from the horizon a black cloud. A dud, the storm god, rumbled inside of it. Aragat pulled out the mooring poles, so the, the boat uh, starts. Ford went Ninurta and made the dikes overflow. The Anunnaki lifted up the torches, setting the land ablaze with their flare. Okay, so apparently they burn the entire land. Sounds a bit like Sodom and Gomorrah, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, then the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. So the water uh, is higher than the mountains. Over here, line 115. All day long, the south wind blew, blowing fast, submerging the mountain in water. Uh, so here also the water goes above the mountains. Um, yeah, here it's described a little bit more in detail, uh, overwhelming the people like an attack. No one could see his fellow. They could not recognize each other in the torrent. Um, but uh, look at this. The gods were frightened by the flood. So even the gods get afraid by it because it's so terrible, right? It's, uh, and they retreated, ascending to the heaven of Anu. The gods were cowering like dogs, crouching by the outer wall. Ishtar shrieked like a woman in childbirth. And yeah, then the gods regret the decision. Um, the olden days have alas turned to clay because I said evil things in the assembly of the gods. How could I say evil things in the assembly of the gods? Ordering a catastrophe uh, to destroy my people. No sooner have I given birth to my dear people than they fill the sea like so many fish. Um, the gods, those of the Anunnaki, were weeping with her. The gods humbly said, weeping, sobbing with grief. Yeah, here the flood is for 40 days upon the earth. Over here, six days and seven nights came the wind and flood, the storm flattening the land. Uh, when the seventh day arrived, the storm was pounding. The uh, flood was a war struggling with itself like a woman writhing in labor. Then Genesis 8, um, the flood stops, okay? God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assorged. And the waters assuaged. I don't know. I don't, I don't know that word. Um, the fountains also of the deep and uh, the window of heaven were stopped. Right. The water from below and from above stops and the rain from heaven was restrained and the waters returned from off the earth continually. After the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. Uh, over here, the sea calmed, fell still, the whirlwind and flood uh, stopped up. I looked around all day long, quiet had set in. Here, this is an interesting line, 140, and all the human beings had turned to clay. Remember, the humans were made from clay and Enlil isn't such a monster as Yahweh, right? He, uh, Yahweh just kills all the people. Enlil apparently has turned the people back to clay. Okay, line six. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which we had made. So he opens the window. Here I opened a vent and fresh air fell upon the side of my nose. The waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, 
where the tops of the mountains seen. So the land reappears. Here 147. I looked around for coastlines in the expanse of the sea and at 12 leagues there emerged a region of land. So land emerges here also. Um, the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. Also an interesting name, Ararat, uh, that's in the Caucasus. Um, many people try to find the ark there. Nobody has ever <laughs> found anything. Um, but Ararat is actually the same word as Urartu in, um, in the Hebrew language. And Urartu was a, a huge uh, country there. Uh, so it could be any mountain in that country. Okay. Yeah, he lands on a mountain. And here uh, Utnapishtim also lands on a mountain, Mount Nimush. Yeah, then Noah does nothing for 40 days. Over here, um, Utnapishtim does nothing for seven days. And then after these uh, 40 days over here, um, he set forth a dove from him uh, to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him uh, into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. So he sends a dove, it doesn't find any land, so it comes back, and he knows that there is no uh, land yet. Um, over here, the exact same thing happens. I sent forth a dove and released it. Uh, the dove went off but came back to me. No perch was visible, so it circled back to me. The exact same thing. Okay. Um, over here, he th then sends a swallow, but the same thing happens again. Uh, came back to him. And after that, um, he sends a raven, which I think is the symbol of Enlil. Um, at least Enlil some, uh, can turn into a raven. Um, and the raven then saw the waters slither back. It eats, it scratches, it bobs, but uh, does not circle back to me. So here he then knows, okay, it's safe to, uh, to leave the boat. And uh, here, and he sent forth a raven, also a raven, which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Okay, so also a raven. Uh, they are just in a, a different order here. But notice in the Genesis story, the raven also doesn't return. Okay, he, he is sent out earlier, but he doesn't return, just like in Gilgamesh. A small difference uh, here, the dove comes back with a twig. Um, um, over here in the Gilgamesh epic, it just doesn't return. Okay, then uh, the people exit the ark. Genesis 8.18, Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing and every fowl and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after the kinds went forth out of the ark. Over here, 166, then I sent out everything in all directions and sacrificed a sheep. Um, yeah, this is exactly what Noah does next. Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The exact same thing. I offered incense in front of the mountain ziggurat. Uh, seven and seven cult vessels I put in place, so he also built an altar. Uh, and God smelled the sweet savor. 100. 
73, the gods smell to the sweet savor. The exact same thing happens. Um, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Okay, he decides here, well, humans are just this way. I cannot uh, kill them again and again, right? Because uh, for, for being wicked and, uh, uh, and stiff-necked or something, that's just the way they are. And this is exactly what we had seen in the Atrahasis epic, right? Where, uh, because, because uh, humans were created with the blood of Awilu, right? The, the rebellious god. Right here, here it's basically talking about that. The imagination of man's heart is evil from his use. This is the way humans have been created, with the blood of Awilu. Okay, um, then we have a small difference here because, well, the Gilgamesh epic is polytheistic. Uh, we have Enki and Enlil in disagreement about the destruction of humans, right uh, here in line 185, Enlil arrives. So he now only learns that humans have survived. And uh, yeah, he's furious. Uh, he saw the boat and became furious. He was filled with rage at the Igigi gods. Where did a living being escape? No man was to survive the annihilation. <laughs> so uh, of course, that's not something that you can have in uh, the Noah story because there only is one god. So. Uh, this one god is the one who uh, decided to rescue Noah. So of course this part could not be taken. Um, then down here, uh, Enki talks to Enlil. Be compassionate, lest mankind be cut off. Be patient, lest they be killed. Um, so uh, Enki calms him down um, or, or tells him to calm down. And um, yeah, then here, Instead of you bringing on the flood, uh, yeah, instead uh, lions should diminish people, wolves should diminish people. So he again says humans should be mortal, just like uh, God Yahweh had decided they should only get to live 120 years, just like in all the other stories uh, they decided humans should be mortal. Famine, pestilent error. Error is a pestilence god. Uh, appeared to ravage the land. So uh, by this, uh, they convince uh, Enlil to not bring other floods. And here God says, neither will I again smite anymore everything living as I have done. So here God also decides not to bring another flood. But, um, but he, he, again, he says here, uh, man's heart is evil from his use. Here in line 100, 35, uh, Utnapishtim says something similar to his wife. Mankind is deceptive and will deceive you. Yeah, after Enki had convinced Enlil, Enlil goes inside the boat. Bit funny to imagine. Um, um, he goes inside the boat, uh, grasps Utnapishtim's hand, uh, and um, yeah, he and his wife kneel before Enlil. Um, Enlil touches their foreheads and blesses them. Previously, Utnapishtim was a human being, uh, but now let them become like us, uh, the gods. Over here in Genesis 9.1, we have something similar. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So here God also blesses, but he only blesses the men. <laughs> yeah, the Bible is so misogynistic. Um, then verse 13, something that people who uh, hate the rainbow flag apparently don't know. God set his bow in the clouds and it shall be for a token of a covenant between God and the earth. So the rainbow is actually God's logo. <laughs> um, over here in line 175, uh, Belet Eli, uh, that's Ninchosan, the mountain goddess, arrives and um, 
she lifted up the large flies, the beads, which Anu had made for his enjoyment. So, uh, so she's talking about her necklace. Okay. Uh, in, in the Bible, we have uh, something about um, the rainbow. And here we have a mountain goddess talking about a necklace. I think from this, I think we can conclude that uh, the necklace of, um, of Ninhozang is the rainbow. Because here uh, God does this to remember the covenant. And here Ninhozang says, uh, Surely, as I shall not forget this lapis lazuli around my neck. Uh, lapis lazuli is a blue precious stone, um, still pretty expensive. Surely, as she should not forget this necklace, she should not forget this day. And Liel may not come to the incense offering, because without considering, he brought about the flood and consigned my people to annihilation. So she also uh, wants to remember that this flood was wrong. Okay, just like God. Uh, uses a rainbow to remember that the flood was wrong. Okay, that was the comparison between uh, Noah's Ark and the Gilgamesh epic. Um, frankly, I think these things are so similar that anybody who tells you that uh, there's just some similarity, either they don't know what they're talking about, maybe they haven't compared them themselves. In that case, they shouldn't tell you that uh, these aren't the same story because they just don't know or they're lying really look at this this is so similar uh, it's it's at times i would say word for word identical and uh, you have pretty much the exact same things happening even rare things that uh, are not something that you would commonly say uh, and pretty much in the exact same order right i i didn't jump around uh, between this, uh, the lines here, right? And I pretty much went uh, through both stories somewhat line for line and everything matched up perfectly, right? This is not uh, just a coincidence. This is the same story. I honestly cannot imagine that the author of Noah's Ark didn't have a copy of the Gilgamesh epic on the same table while he was writing it, okay? There's some just minor changes to accommodate uh, monotheism instead of polytheism. And apart from that, I think it's just a translation. Okay, um, before I come to the big bombshell, um, let me mention a, a few more things. Um, here in the Avesta, that's the Zoroastrian Bible, in Fargard 2, we have the story Yima, Yamshet, and the Deluge. Um, here we have uh, Ahura Mazda, the main god, um, uh, I think talking to Zarathustra, uh, also called Zoroaster, the founder of the religion. Um, here it also talks about um, yeah, uh, problems with overpopulation. And uh, here it's first solved by increasing the world. They make the world grow. Yes, I will nourish and rule, watch over the world. But uh, yeah, that doesn't solve the problem. Uh, people just uh, reproduce too much again. And um, after 300 years, um, the earth was replenished again and uh, uh, there was room no more. So they have the same problem again. And uh, yeah, that repeats a few times. But uh, yeah, then they finally decide this uh, cannot go forever like this. Actually, I don't know why it shouldn't. An omnipotent God should be able to do that. But uh, yeah, here uh, in line 20, Ahura Mazda called together a meeting of the celestial Yasatas in the Ariana Vayeyu of high renown. And Look, it talks here about by the Vangui Daitya. Uh, let's Google that. Um, apparently, this is in the Caucasus, just like Ararat. 
to that meeting of these uh, celestial beings. Zoroastrianism is monotheistic, of course, they had uh, to have uh, celestial beings instead of gods. Um, to that meeting came fair Yima, uh, the good shepherd. Uh, he came together with the best of the mortals. Again, something that uh, you had in all these stories, you had priests and uh, people who are humble and uh, it's always the best humans uh, there are who survive. And uh, here they tell uh, fair Yima, evil winters about to fall that shall bring the fierce deadly frost upon the material world. And then he tells them beasts that live in the wilderness um, and those that live on top of the mountains in the bottom of the dale shall take shelter in underground abodes. Okay, so he's not supposed to build a boat, but an underground abode. Um, before the, that winter, the country would bear plenty of grass for cattle before the waters had flooded it. What? what what's it talking about a flood here? But uh, yeah, okay. So he's supposed to build a shelter. Here, make a vara, that's the name of the shelter, long as a riding ground on every side of uh, the square. So just like in the Sumerian stories, it's supposed to have a square um, shape. And bring the seeds of sheep and oxen, of men, of dogs, of birds, and of red blazing fires. He doesn't bring the animals themselves, he only brings the seed. I don't know, maybe this is talking about uh, the animals carrying that seed, right? But. Uh, Honestly, I think he, this is really just talking about the seed. Um, I think that he's also somewhere told to bring seeds of different um, plants. So um, uh, Richard Carrier talks about this cosmic sperm bank, right? That uh, people believed in back in the day and uh, which he um, talks about when he says that, yeah, Jesus is the son of David, that David's seed was in this cosmic sperm bank. And people mock Richard Carrier for this because he, they say nobody would believe such nonsense. Here, here we see it. People believe this. Here we have such a cosmic sperm bank. Uh, we, here we have uh, gods taking seeds to save them. And let's not forget that Ahura Mazda also saved some sperm of uh, Zoroaster to later create the Messiah Sao Shant. So uh, people totally believed in this cosmic sperm bank. You don't need to make fun of Richard Carrier here. Yeah. All those seeds shalt thou bring two of every kind to be kept inexhaustible there. This is actually an interesting point, right? Um, Zoroastrianism had a huge influence on uh, Judaism when the Jews were in the Babylonian exile and the Persians freed them. The Persians were Zoroastrians. So they had uh, King, uh, King Cyrus became a huge prophet for Judaism and he was the Persian king, right? So, uh, and here we uh, now have these two of every kind that we find in the Bible. I think this is where it comes from because in the Sumerian texts, uh, it just talks about uh, them bringing the animals, all the animals, his animals, whatever. But here it's two of every kind, right? So I think this is where the Bible takes this two of every kind from. Uh, there shall be no humpbacked and so on, uh, similarly to Leviticus 22. The humpbacked, the bulged, uh, impotent lunatic, uh, why are they not allowed? Because they are stamped by Angra Mainyu, the Zoroastrian version of Satan. Then this vara, this abode, is supposed to have nine streets, six in the middle part, three in the smallest, and the streets of the largest part. Thou shalt bring a thousand seats of men and women uh, to the streets of the middle part, 600, to the streets of the smallest part, 300. So we have three sections here, just like the levels of Noah's Ark. Um, and frankly, this kind of reminds me of the description of New Jerusalem, I think, in Revelation. Thou shalt make a door and a window. 
Okay, again, a door and a window. And then Yima is supposed to crush the earth with a stamp of thy heel and then knead it with thy hands as the potter does when kneading the potter's clay. Okay, strange that the human now uh, destroys the earth. I don't know. Uh, this sounds more like uh, the destruction, the, the Armageddon in the end. Um, which in Zoroastrianism is called Frakoshereti, uh, not Armageddon. And uh, yeah, then he brings uh, the animals and that Vara, he sealed up with the golden ring. Again, he seals it, uh, the door, the window. But um, yeah, unlike uh, these other stories, it appears that uh, the man in the Vara, which Yima made, live the happiest life, it appears they stayed there forever. Um, I don't know, maybe that's a paradise they are talking about. Yeah, that was the Zoroastrian version of the story. Now let me uh, briefly talk about a Hurrian version. This is from the Song of the Sea. Um, that's CTH 346.9 if you want to look it up. Um, this is a really broken tablet. Uh, I find it amazing that we have anything about it. Um, so, uh, and this is a German translation, so I will have to translate it for you on the fly. Uh, floods covered the land. Um, the floods rose and reached up to the sun god and moon god and reached up to the stars of heaven. Okay, so now the water doesn't only go above the mountains, it reaches millions of miles up to the uh, sun and the moon and uh, the stars. <laughs> okay, that's complete nonsense, right? Uh, this is totally something from, uh, yeah, people back then believed in a flat earth, right? Like the, uh, the earth swimming on the water. This is totally what you see here, right? because they believed that the stars were just little lights on this dome, right? So uh, this totally doesn't make sense when you know the reality of uh, the stars being millions of miles away. And then Kumabi, the main god, um, speaks to the other gods and asks gods, which god did we not acknowledge enough? We didn't, something broken uh, the sea, so apparently they didn't acknowledge the sea enough and uh, yeah then bring tribute to the sea yeah lapis lazuli uh, silver gold parasha stone um, yeah they throw that into the water and as, as a tribute to the sea and uh, then yeah it, it's really badly broken it's hard to make out anything but uh, you leave them alive, humans maybe, maybe humans get saved, I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's just too broken to say anything more. But uh, but uh, yeah, this is uh, possibly the oldest version of the story um, because this is a Hurrian story and the Hurrians came from this region in Urartu here in uh, around Lake Van. And um, well, uh, on the channel of Krakenfort, you will find, um, he tells us that uh, the deluge story apparently comes from somewhere in that region here. Okay. Um, I don't know, the Black Sea deluge uh, hypothesis is quite popular that people lived here where the Black Sea is now. And then maybe here this, uh, uh, this connection between the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea was then opened and uh, the Black Sea was flooded. That's a popular hypothesis, but uh, as far as I know, it's been disproven. Um, okay, now before I reveal the bombshell, let me recap. We had the Atrahasis epic, right? Which the oldest copy of that epic was found in a city called Shurupak. Okay, we had the Sumerian flood myth, 
which explicitly mentions Shurupak. Okay. The flood hero here is Zio Sutra, who, according to the Sumerian king list, uh, was a king of Shurupak. Um, also, according to the instructions of Shurupak, he is uh, the recipient of the instructions of Shurupak, the Sumerian Ten Commandments, if you will. Um, so this is uh, four times Shurupak, the Gilgamesh epic. Um, also uh, talks about the city of Shurupak, okay? And the reference to Ubaratutu, who was also a king of Shurupak, according to the Sumerian king list. And uh, Gilgamesh uh, himself came from Uruk, which is just the next city uh, down the stream from Shurupak, okay? So in three of these stories, we have five references to Shurupak, okay? Now, what is Shurupak? Shurupak is a city, and uh, yeah, here in, uh, over here in Mesopotamia, uh, today's Iraq, and get this, the city of Shurupak was destroyed by a flood. The city of Shurupak was destroyed by a flood. Here, that's this, uh, uh, here, this uh, MEL Mellow one, Noah's Flood Reconsidered, Volume 26, Number 2, uh, Autumn 1964, in a book called Iraq. So, um, yeah, let's look into that article here. Um, on JSTOR, you are allowed to read it for free. And um, they report here um, the excavation of Shurupak. And uh, yeah, there's even pictures where they uh, where they point out uh, the different strata of uh, um, different deposits and stuff. So, yeah, there's actual geological evidence that Shurupak was destroyed by a flood. Okay, so from this, we can conclude that the Sumerian stories are talking about this one flood. Okay, and Noah's Ark is a one to one copy almost of Gilgamesh. So Noah's Ark effectively also talks about this one flood, okay? It's not global, it's not a global flood. It's destroyed only one city. And I guess that just over time, the, the stories about it just became bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Uh, uh, Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata uh, mentions a destruction with, uh, with a flood of a city. But uh, yeah, I think just over time, this story was uh, increased and increased and increased. Just like when you uh, catch a fish, then the fish gets bigger and bigger and bigger every time you talk about it, right? And yeah, apparently that's what happened here. This actual flood has turned into the story of Noah's Ark, okay? Noah's Ark is, an, uh, is in a way telling the truth because it's talking about an actual flood. But in another way, it's not telling the truth because that flood just wasn't global. Okay, it, it was just a, a local flood that destroyed one or two cities. Uruk may also have been uh, um, harmed in that flood. But um, yeah, in the end, this is what we are talking about. This is what Noah's Ark is about. This small flood. Um, it is believed that it may have been a dam breakage. Um, it's conjectured that this dam breakage may even have been intentional, right? Uh, it's conjectured that um, this happened uh, in a fight between Sumerians and Semites, which would actually make sense in my uh, opinion, because um, around that same time, uh, this flood would have been 2900 BCE. Um, and here in uh, 2600 BCE, 
not too far from that, there was uh, this war between Uma and Lagash, and there, uh, Samites actually did use water as a as a weapon in that war. Um, what was it? I think, uh, if I remember correctly, Uma redirected a stream, and then uh, Lagash had no water anymore, or something like that. So yeah, Samites did use water as a weapon for war in those times. So. Uh, it would make sense to me that uh, that this may have been an intentional dam breakage as an act of war. Maybe not, but uh, yeah, the uh, but this flood did happen, whether or not intentional, I don't know. And how did these stories even get into the Bible? Um, well, in 1636 BCE, uh, the Babylonian king Amisa Duga ordered that Sumerian texts should be collected and translated to Akkadian, the language they spoke in Babylon at the time. Um, and yeah, I think that's just what happened. They found the Atrahasis epic, translated it, and then incorporated that into the Gilgamesh epic. And uh, that's why they are so similar. And um, yeah, when the uh, Jews were in the Babylonian exile, uh, they had access to that uh, Gilgamesh epic and mm, yeah, they just copied it. Again, I think these stories are so similar, I really cannot imagine that uh, the author of Noah's Ark wrote that story without having a copy of the Gilgamesh epic on the same table while he wrote it. So, but uh, yeah, I think that's, that's how we got this story. Uh, this story of a dam breakage 5,000 years ago. Okay, that's all I wanted to talk about today. I think this is going to be a very long video. Uh, yeah, anyhow, if you like this video, like it, share it, subscribe, and see you next time.